All right, hello everybody. We are gonna go ahead and get started. So first of all, thank you all for joining us. And this is how to start an outdoor classroom at any school part two. And hopefully many of you um, got to join us for part one, but if not, welcome. And we are gonna introduce ourselves shortly. So here we go. Amy, are you ready? Sorry, everyone, one second, just trying to get our audio set up here. Okay. Amy, you wanna try that now? Yep, can you hear me? Yes, got Yay! it. Yay! Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, we just wanted, first of all, to thank you for taking the time out of your day. We know that you've all been teaching today, um, either in school or have been out in the forest, have been, you know, just active with your busy lives and you could be doing a lot of other things tonight, but you've chosen to come and join us tonight. So thank you so much. And I just wanted to just share um, something that I'm grateful for today. It's a nice way um, to kind of bring ourselves to this, to being present and being here. This is a practice that we do with our students. And something I'm really thankful for is our true harbinger of spring in Vermont is the red-winged blackbird. And I heard it this morning. So I know that the snow is going to melt even though we're supposed to get another snowstorm. Um, so I just invite you to think of something that you're grateful for tonight um, just before we start and dive into our schedule. So thank you for coming and being here tonight. Right, so just quick intros. Um, I'm Natalie, also known as Nature Natalie, and I'm based in San Francisco. And I'm a first grade teacher at Presidio Hill School, which is an independent school out here. And there I've had the privilege of starting the Forest Fridays program which is how I came to be in this work. And if you'd like to know more about that, you can check out the website, patronatalie.com. Great, and my name is Amy Butler. Um, also, as you see on this slide, Amy Coyote or Miss Coyote. Coyote is my nature name and that's what a lot of students call me and they actually think my last name is Coyote. Um, my last name is actually Butler and I am the Director of Education at the North Branch Nature Center in Montpelier, Vermont. That is the capital of Vermont. And what the work that I do is I help teachers start nature immersion programs, primarily in public schools. So my focus is working with preschool teachers through second grade, but the rest of my colleagues at the Nature Center also work with teachers third through sixth grade, helping them get outside every single week with their students for extended periods of time throughout the entire school year. So we just wanted a quick review. If you weren't with us for the first webinar, you can access that. Um, you will receive these slides of this entire webinar in an email. And you're able, I think in one of the slides previous, the, one of the opening slides um, when I was sharing some gratitude, there's a link there that you can get um, to the first webinar and listen to that. So if you haven't had a chance to do that, please do that. But a quick review in part one, the first webinar that Natalie and I did was here's three things right here on the slide that we covered. We we covered, I can teach outdoors. We are all educators, we're all teachers. We love working with children. Teaching outside is something that you actually already know how to do. So we talked about the why and why this work is important and thinking about um, why this movement is happening across the United States and then through many countries. So that was one topic we talked about. Another one was about alliance building and how to get support in your community to start doing this kind of work because it takes more than just yourself and your students to get out the door. You're going to need help. And the other thing that we talked about in the first webinar was the place that you find. Where is it that you're going to go to every week? What is the space that you're going to utilize? green space, natural space, wild space, whatever you want to call it, where, how can you access that in your community? And tonight, we're going to build on those three things that we talked about. You'll still get a lot out of tonight if you weren't part of the first webinar, but we really encourage you to go back and listen to the first one as well. Yeah, definitely. And one more thing I just wanted to quickly remind people is that um, tonight's webinar is scheduled to be one hour, and we will have 
time for questions and answers at the end, hopefully, if we don't talk too much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just for some people, I thought it might be longer than that. So just wanted to let you know, it's just one hour. And if you have to leave early, totally fine. We're recording this. Um, and as Amy said, we're gonna send out the slides and the whole presentation within the next couple of days. So we hope you can stay the whole time, but if not, that is fine and you will not miss anything. All right, so what are we gonna do tonight? So part two is gonna be all about what we're calling the outside work. So what you do once you actually get out the door with your kids. Um, so to start, we're gonna talk about the school of nature-based learning. So the nuts and bolts of how to schedule this, how to structure your time once you're outside um, and how to fit in that academic piece, you know, which would, a lot of teachers understandably are concerned about and want to make sure that this is actually enhancing their students academic experience. So we'll touch on all of that. Then we will dive into talking about safety, um, how to keep everyone both physically and emotionally safe when you're out in nature. And finally, we're going to talk about the very practical subject of good gear. So what you really need and what you don't <laughs> and how to get it for you and your students. So that is where we're going tonight. So we're gonna dive right in here with the School of Nature-Based Learning. And the first thing you wanna think about is when are you actually going to be able to do this? And this is the scheduling. And as we all know, when you work in a school, schedules can be super tricky to navigate and there's a lot of factors to consider. So we're just gonna to touch on a few of those tonight um, and just know that you know what works for us may not work for you and you really need to cater this to your own school's unique needs and their students' needs. But with that said, um, when you're thinking about when in the week you will go, we really recommend trying to go at the same time each week if possible. If you can make it a regular part of your schedule, that just makes it all the better, especially, you know, once it starts getting to be bad weather or not bad weather, but, you know, more extreme weather. If you can just have this as part of your routine, you'll be much more likely to go regardless of the weather. Um, and you also want to think about what other schedule constraints you have. So if you have specialist classes on certain days, or if your school has assemblies every Wednesday or every Friday, some schools have early release days, you want to keep those things in mind as well. Personally, I go on Fridays. Um, I find it a really nice way to end the week. It gives me and the kids something to look forward to. And, you know, on Fridays, the kids are tired, teachers are tired, and it's just a great time to be able to go be outside and you know, use that energy in a different way and just have a really nice bookmark to end the week. So, um, and after doing this for a few years now, I have worked with my administration ahead of time to make sure that my schedule is set up so that I don't have any specialist classes on Friday afternoons and things like that. So, you know, the first year was a little tricky because I didn't know I was going to be doing this, but if you can get into the place where you're able to do some of the preventative work to avoid some of the schedule conflicts, that makes a big difference as well. Natalie, I might just add today, I was meeting with a group of teachers and we were, um, they go out on Thursdays and one group of kindergarten teachers goes out in the morning and another group goes out in the afternoon and they both had different perspectives on what was, whether morning was better or afternoon was better. The afternoon teachers liked the afternoon because they had all morning to pre-teach and scaffold the learning. Right. Um, the morning teachers like the morning better because they were able to follow up in their afternoon and do journaling and kind of, you know, um, reflect and extract and do writing um, with their kindergartners in the afternoon. So, yeah, it, it's what works for you and um, days of the week are great. The one day of the week I wouldn't recommend is Monday. Yeah. <laughs> If, no, if for no other reason, then there seems to be the most days off of school on Mondays. There's always holidays, so you miss it a lot. If you yes, and, and students coming in not prepared, um, yes. you know, with clothing or food or anything else they need and having had a long weekend. Right. Um, yeah, and, you know, there's, so there's, that's a great point that there's no right or wrong time to do this. It really just depends, and you can make any time work pretty much. I mean, yeah, we, I've done it at different times and this is what's working for me, but yeah, definitely figure out what works for you. So once you're out there, um, how long will you stay? And I'd say this is really dependent on the age of your students and how far away your site is. So how far you're gonna be traveling to and from. I've found that for first graders and second graders, three hours is sort of the sweet spot. And I think that probably holds true for lower elementary kids. Um, more than that, and you risk kids getting overly tired and or conflicts start to just increase dramatically, I have found. 
Um, but if it's less than that, it can be hard to really get the kids to fully, you know, relax into the nature and be able to really get anything out of it. So, you know, a little time is better than no time at all, but if you can, I would aim for about three hours. Um, thinking about how often you will go, we both are big fans of weekly trips to the forest um, or wherever you're going to go. However, you know, we realize that's not always feasible. So I would say minimum once every two weeks, if at all possible. If you go less than that, it can, you risk it starting to feel more like a field trip or just like a special one-off occasion. And the real beauty of this kind of work is if you can make it a routine, it has a huge impact on all aspects of the kids. Um, school experience. So we definitely recommend, you know, at least twice a month whenever possible. Um, in terms of when to start in the school year, you know, you could really start at any time. There's, again, no right or wrong way to do this. One approach is to start at the beginning of the year, um, and many teachers like to sort of build this into their first six weeks of school. Maybe if you do responsive classroom, you know, about, um, you know, the gradual release and uh, interactive modeling, I think that's what it's called. I'm blanking on the terms, but anyway, the routines of your nature-based program can be part of your classroom routine introduction in that beginning of the year. So it's a nice time since you're introducing so much new things, so many new things anyway, this kind of just gets folded into that. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can definitely introduce it at any point in the year. Just keep in mind that in the beginning, you may not even leave the school campus for the first few times. You know, you really want to put in the time to build the foundation, lay the groundwork, and make sure the kids are really ready. Um, you might even just practice putting on gear and taking it off for a few weeks or lining up and going and standing outside the school building and then coming right back in. So don't be afraid to go slow and gradually build up to a full session where you actually go for three hours and come back. Um, I would say it's probably ideal to start during fair weather so the kids can get comfortable outdoors before they're immersed in some more extreme temperatures or weather conditions. Um, but you know your kids best, so figure out what will work for you. And finally, some challenges when scheduling. You know, there are many, but I think one of the things that comes up a lot is if students are receiving any sort of push-in or pull-out services at school, it can be tricky to navigate around that um, because there are, you know, strict requirements about minutes and all of this. So you just want to make sure that you're in close contact with any of your support teachers or anyone else who's going to be um, impacted if you are leaving campus for a significant amount of time. Um, another thing to think about is food. <laughs> so if you're going to be going out during a snack or a lunch time, then you're going to need to bring your food with you, obviously. And if students are getting lunch at school or food at school, you'll need to coordinate with the people who are providing the food to make sure that you can get that food ahead of time pick it up on your way or whatever the system is going to be. Um, think about what you're going to do with the trash, um, you know, all of these little logistical details. Just make sure you think through that ahead of time. And then finally, if your school has any sort of unexpected mandatory events, like my school tends to have guest speakers come at the last minute or assemblies that we all have to go to that no one knew about. So just keep in mind that those things do come up and it may interfere with your schedule a little bit, but as with all things, flexibility is key and just try to get out as often as you can. All right, that was a lot of me talking, so I'm gonna move on here. Amy's going great. Yeah. So we're gonna dive into talking about some core routines of nature connection. Um, you have crafted your why this is important to you. You've built alliances in your school and with your parents and caregivers. You have your gear. You have the time um, of the week built into your schedule to go out. Everybody has what they need. You leave the building. What happens? What does this look like? And actually, it's, it's really almost not that much different than building routines inside your classroom. So even within the first eight weeks of school, if you're following a responsive classroom schedule, the core routines of nature connection um, can be applied in a really similar way. So those core routines of connection are coming from John Young's work in the Coyote's Guide um, of Nature Connection. And it's something that Natalie and I have both um, come to practice and understand and have found that 
these core routines come from indigenous tribes across the world and they are inherent to human beings and they're timed with our biorhythm. We could spend an entire webinar, actually we could spend a few weeks talking about how this works, but what we want to do is take the work that John Young has done and his colleagues have done with the core routines and share them with you um, and how that we how we have found that they work um, for a nature immersion program or a forest Friday or whatever you want to call this time. Mm -hmm. These are learning habits. Core routines are not lesson plans. It's not a set curriculum. You as the teacher can create lesson plans for learning outside, um, can create a unit of study, but the core routines are habits of learning that you do every single time that you go outside. Just like in your classroom, when your students come in in the morning, they have some kind of job to do, or they go to um, a table time, or you have a circle in the morning. They have a routine every single day. It's predictable. They understand what it is. And your classroom kind of runs like clockwork on the best days. <laughs> um, so these core routines of nature connection um, help you kind of frame that time outside. So Natalie, if you want to jump to the next yeah. slide, or if you want to add something. Yeah, really quickly, I just wanted to add, um, you know, just to let people know, like, I don't have a naturalist background. I did not major in environmental education or anything like that. Um, and so the way that I really got into this work and learned about it myself was through the core routines. Uh, so I just wanted to let people know that, you know, if you think that you have to be an expert in the outdoors or environmental science in order to do this, you don't. And core routines are a really great way for you to learn right alongside the students. Um, and to find your place in the outdoors. So it's a really, really great tool for everyone. Wait, Natalie, can you go back one slide? Yeah. Can you go back to that slide for a second? So I just want everyone to take a look at these. These are all public school teachers throughout Vermont. There's a couple from out of state. They all come from different types of schools within Vermont. Some come from schools um, that have all of their resources met and children's needs met, and some of them come from very, very impoverished communities. So these teachers have gathered together. They come to us in the summertime in Montpelier, Vermont at North Branch Nature Center to take a week-long training with us. And if you look closely at this picture, this is our last day together. Everybody's smiling. Everyone had a great time. We practice the core routines every single week. So the core routines are also for us to embody and practice and feel. And when we know what they feel like as educators and the adults, then therefore we are able to share them um, with the children as well. Okay, next slide. Happy teachers. Everyone likes to see slides of happy teachers. So when we say core routine, I kind of made this diagram, um, this Venn diagram here, and this is inspired by John's work in his um, book, Coyote Mentoring. So core, when we talk about core, we're talking about what is the center? What is the foundation? What is the heart of this work? This might be um, your social emotional learning curriculum in your classroom. These might be the values that you hold and um, nurture in your children. This is your why you're taking your children outside. The routines, when we think of routines, it's, it's a habit, it's a practice, and it's a discipline. And we know when we have consistent routines with children that are known to them, they flourish. And with connection, no child in your class is going to be able to learn and flourish without connection to you as the adult, as the mentor. So that's that bond and that relationship that we have. When we have all three of those things, which that's what these core routines that indigenous people all over the world they've found have practiced, we create brain patterning. We create um, an understanding of how things work and we create really strong patterns of learning and predictability and also a place where children can lead. Um, so this is just, we did this in our last um, webinar. These are just things for you to think about and for you to kind of carry along um, as you go, as you go into this work. So um, here's some children outside in Vermont and they are muddy and they are dirty and they are vibrant. And so we look for um, indicators of how this is working. And when I look at this photograph, 
I can see a couple other children in the background engaged and I see vibrancy and I see happiness and I see children being comfortable outside. They are in their mm, about fourth or fifth routine of, the, of, of their time outside of their three hour time outside. Um, and it, these routines are almost like the walls of your classroom without being walls because um, it's so expansive outside. So I just wanted to kind of share these kind of indicators of this is working. These children are happy and they're in this place that they feel really good at, really good in. So the first routine, one of the first routines is you leaving the building. Um, what does this look like when you leave the building? Natalie and I had also thought to share um, what happens before you leave the building, which is getting dressed, having a morning meeting. But really, once you exit the building, what does this look like? And it needs, you, what's really important is to set a standard that this is different than recess. We know how children leave the building for recess. They explode out of the building and onto a playground or into a playscape. Um, we want to kind of close this in and hold this time that when they leave the building, this is still a time for learning and building community. And when we leave the building for eco, um, educating children outdoors, that's what we call our program in Vermont, children stop and they listen. They take a breath in and they notice their surroundings. And in the picture on the left, the children looking over the fence, we actually, these are preschoolers and they make observations every single week of this space and we take a photograph. So leaving the building, how, what does it look like when you leave the building? The next slide. Natalie, do you want to talk to this one? Yeah, yeah. so just to clarify, we're not, we're going to just kind of or touch on a few of the core routines. There are many, there's over 13. Um, and we wanted to talk about all of them, but we realized that was going to take <laughs> such a long time. So we are just kind of highlighting some of our favorites and the ones that we think are really, really important. So just so you know, there are others. And if you want to know more about them, definitely check out John Young's book. Okay, so once you have arrived at your destination or your meeting place for the day, it's a really good time to play a game. Um, this could be, you know, a traditional game, or it could be a song, it could be a dance, it could be some sort of movement exercise, or just a circle time. And it's a really good transition activity. So they've been walking, they've been moving, they've been, you know, in transit, and now we're transitioning to a more focused, quiet time. So this is a great opportunity to get those last wiggles out, kind of get them centered. And it also provides a really nice time for teachers to check in with kids. Um, if somebody was having a rough morning or had a tricky time on the walk, this is a really good time for one of the adults who's with you to take a moment to pull that student aside and just check in with them and get them grounded and ready for the rest of the day. Um, so if you are playing a game, it, for me and Amy, it's usually related to whatever our focus lesson of the day is. So, if, you know, in my class, if we're talking about animal tracking that day, then we're going to maybe play a fox walking game where we practice walking like foxes and sneaking up on animals. Um, if we're talking about trees, like we're going to do tomorrow in my class, then we play this game called build a tree where the kids actually make a tree out of their bodies. So there, it's nice if there's some connection, sort of acts as that hook for the kids to pull them into the lesson um, and give them a little preview of what they're going to learn that day. And one thing I just like to mention with this is, as always, flexibility is really important here. I can't tell you how many times I've had a certain activity planned. We get there and the kids are, you know, their energy level is off the charts or they're really, really sleepy or whatever it is. And suddenly I have to completely change what I was planning. So just know that as always, the best laid plans don't always go as you wish. So just be flexible and it's nice to have a few options in your back pocket that you can come back to. So, you know, find a few games or activities that you know your class likes and that you could do without any materials. Just have those ready to go. It's always good advice. All right. Um, so after you've played a game, then it's time to start settling down. So as you'll see in this picture, you know, we like to have our kids gather in some sort of circle or square around the fire, around the hearth, whatever you want to call it, but somewhere where they can really sit down and focus for a, you know, significant amount of time. And one of the best ways to get them drawn in and engaged and quieting down is through storytelling. And as educators, this is something we already know and something that we do probably every day in our classroom. 
Um, but in the forest or in nature, it's going to look a little different. Um, the tradition of oral story, excuse me, oral story, storytelling um, is a core routine and it's very, very powerful. Um, it's different from a, cl a classroom read aloud because when you're reading in the classroom, you usually have a book, you might have an objective, um, a comprehension strategy or something like this that you're trying to convey to the children. But when you're outside, you ideally actually have the story kind of in your head and memorized or just you're making it up as you go sometimes, but there isn't necessarily a physical book or even images for the kids to look at. And this is a great opportunity for them to practice visualizing and really engaging all their senses to process the story that you're telling them. So let's say that you told a story about a mouse looking for a winter home. And Amy's going to share something you could do with that. With the four regimes. And so we have left the building, we've played a game, we've had circle story and possibly snack because it's already turned into that time of your day. Um, and the story prompts your focus lesson. So this is coming into a part of the day where children are ready to learn and ready to get active. And we don't call it a focus lesson <laughs> with the children. We might call it workshop time or our eco challenge. But this is a time where you, as a teacher, um, are potentially held to maybe meeting some standards. Um, so one thing that we um, look at really carefully is what children like to do in the forest. And all of our eco lesson plans um, have been built in a backwards fashion. So we spent a lot of time in the first few years now 10 years in of looking at what children love to do in the forest. Um, and many people have written about this. David Sobel actually um, wrote a book and has included um, seven, these seven design principles for nature um, educators. And one of those design principles of the seven things that children love to do is children love to build small worlds. And so what the teachers and I did was we looked at what is something that a child, every child knows about um, that's accessible to children and that we can learn about the needs of living things and adaptations an NGSS standard and that was mice and children instead of building fairy houses we can build small worlds for mice so this is a lesson plan that is aligned to NGSS standards common core math and literacy about mice and building mouse houses so Natalie if you want to go to the next slide so um, here it is. We um, talked about what mice need to live. We talked about materials that they might use to build a nest. We went out in the schoolyard. We didn't even go to the forest yet. We collected materials in nature that we thought would be good insulating kind of pieces and how they would bind together to make a nest. Do we need to rip them up? Do we need to process them? We also used um, like human made materials because we know that mice do that too. And now, if you can click, let's see if this works. If you click on mouse houses there on the title, that should bring us to a lesson plan. Can you see it? Let's see. Oh, here it is. So this has been the work um, that we've done at North Branch Nature Center. So where here, here it is. Here's this essential question. Where do mice live and what materials do they use to build their nests? The objective and then the NGSS performance expectation. Um, and if you, Natalie, you can, we're not gonna read through all of this, but this is what, um, this is what we have been able to work on with our teachers here in Vermont, to be able to take something that is so simple as building a small world for an animal that children are all familiar with, whether it's a fiction animal or nonfiction. So there's a literacy connection. What are fiction, what are fiction mice and what are nonfiction mice? We have seven different species of mice that live in Vermont and turn it into um, a lesson plan that actually lasts a couple weeks. Now, what happens when children build small worlds and they're learning about mice they kind of become the mice. And then hopefully after that focus time, that goes into their free play and exploration and forest choice time in the forest. And just to let everyone know, um, you're gonna receive this whole slideshow and the links will be in there. So you will be able to access um, anything that we're showing you today. And also there've been a couple of questions about um, references to the books that we've been making. So we'll make sure we put together a list of all the 
yeah. Yeah. John Young and David Silva that we've been mentioning. So make sure you keep an eye out for that lesson. Okay, let me see if I can get back to our presentation. There we go. All right, so moving along here. Yeah, moving right along. Yes. Worst choice. Yes, so once you've done your little focus lesson or you know whatever your theme is for the day, the next part, and in my class, the most exciting for the kids is the free choice or free exploration time, whatever you want to call it. Um, this is really, you know, it's not like learning is over. Now we're just playing. This is actually where learning is going to continue and it's going to be applied and they're going to really start to internalize what you've just taught them. Um, and so this is time for the kids to go out, you know, do the loose parts play, do the risky play, use their creativity and imagination and just explore. And, you know, I think I always like to clarify, this is not complete chaos free for all. This is a really strong mix of structure and freedom. Um, so clear boundaries about where kids can go, but within that relative freedom and choice about what to do in that space. Um, and we're going to talk about adult supervision and ratios and safety in a little bit. So we'll come back to this, but um, just know that this is a really, really rich time for the children. And this is where you're going to see what they got out of your lesson. <laughs> and this is, this is the time too, Natalie, that I'm, that I'm going to add that as teachers, we were watching what children were doing um, as they were becoming more and more comfortable coming back to the same place every single time to play. And actually what we're seeing is a whole STEM or STEAM curriculum unfold in front of us. Um, so then taking, okay, so these children are making a fulcrum, are using levers, and then we might backtrack and turn that into our focus lesson time that the children are expecting to happen after snack and story. And the expectation for us in ECO is that children work on the focus lesson, it might be short, it might be long, and that they check in with an adult and then they go into forest choice. But really looking at what is emergent, what are the children interested in? I mean, in these three slides, I just see STEM all over the place. I mean, science, technology, engineer, math is happening in all three of these. Yeah. And that you saw picture is actually just from last Friday of my class. So we're not, it's not like we're digging these out of ancient history. These things are happening all the time without us prompting, I promise. All right. So. So the, the exhale, um, the, the exhale of your time outside, coming to an end and wrapping it up, sit spot. So um, some of you have, may have heard of this practice. People have been doing it for thousands of years, sitting quietly on the earth. If you have a mindfulness practice in your classroom, if you practice mindfulness with your students, this is dovetails really, really well. So the children all adopt a place in the forest, in the field, wherever it is that you visit regularly. And at the end of your time outside after forest choice, we come back together in a circle, we get our journals, we take a deep breath and we go and we visit our sit spots. It's a way for us to assimilate, reflect, bring our energy down, calm down before we re-enter the building and go back in. Um, I am amazed. I sat today with 26 kindergartners in a snowy forest and they were completely silent. They love their sit spots. They love to go and visit them. They've made tree cookies with their names on them. They hadn't been out in the woods for a while because of all the deep snow we had. They're trying to find their sit spots. They're really attached to these places. Um, and there's so much observation that can happen here. Change over time, change of seasons, bird language, listening to bird song. And as you can see here, these two little girls, they switched their sit spot to a warmer spot in the winter, right where the sun was shining. Um, so just a really important routine. I have found that, and Natalie, you may have found this too, when we don't do sit spot before we go back in the building, things are a little, things can be a little crazy. Um, so it's a very natural um, biorhythm that when we're done learning, we need time to just absorb and assimilate and reflect. And I would say for sit spot, um, like with all of these routines, you know, start slow, start small. So literally we start with 10 seconds on the first day we go yes, out. Exactly. And then the next time we try 30 seconds and then we gradually work up to maybe five minutes of yeah. first grade. So it's not like you're sitting there for an hour. Um, I think yeah. adult, that would be hard for us. So just keep in mind that this is a muscle that they need to build and they need practice. Yeah. So. You don't introduce algebra on the first day of kindergarten math. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. So, um, you know, you've got these core routines, and as we said, there are many more, so please check out the others. But if, once you have these routines established and you've decided what you want to do with your time, how do you actually create plans? How do you create lesson plans? Maybe you're required by your school to submit lesson plans, um, whatever the case may be. Or maybe you're just like me and you feel really lost and scared without a plan, <laughs> so you like to write it all down. Um, so again, as with all things, there are no, there's no right or wrong way to do that. Um, we're going to share a few different formats that we have used for planning, um, and you're welcome to adapt these, but just keep in mind that, you know, you shouldn't take them word for word because these are very place-based um, plans that are specific to our schools, our teachers, our students, and most importantly, the locations that we are working in. So what's going to work for me in California is not going to work for me in Vermont and vice versa necessarily. So just keep that in mind when you're doing your planning that you need to, you know, do your homework, find people in your region to learn from who can educate you about, you know, what are the hazards in your area, what kinds of weather should we be expecting and all of these things, because those are going to be really important in your planning. Um, so I'm just going to quickly show you a few of these. And as with the mouse houses plan, you'll have access to all of these once we share the slides with you. Um, so this is, I call this the natural cycle daily plan. And this is again, drawing from John Young's work in Coyote's Guide, um, talking about this natural cycle of how, you know, we move through the day, how nature moves through the year, through, sorry, through the day, the year, the months, all of the different units of time follow this basic pattern. We start in the Northeast, then we go to the East, and it's a compass rose, as you can see. Um, and each of those cardinal directions has a certain routine or activity associated with it. So I've just kind of split up here on the left about how much of your time you want to spend on each of these activities. Um, and this is based on a three hour program. So if your program is a different length, you know, obviously adjust accordingly. Um, and I, so I've listed the direction as well as what we're doing during each of those times and kind of given a little description. So this might be helpful for you when thinking about how to structure your day. So you'll have access to that. And then Amy, did you want to share your- Yeah, maybe share the, the, third, um, the third plan. Yes, the ECO. The ECO, October 9th, 2018. Yeah, if you want to share that one. Um, so this is a template that we use that also uh, also follows the core routines that we've already shared. Um, so just a different just a different template here with learning objectives um, for each. So you'll see pre-teach and nature library or nature museum. Those are inside the building. Um, morning circle might also be inside the building. And then as you kind of scroll through, you'll see cooperative games, that's a game time, snack, lunch, because sometimes we're out for lunch, and story, that's when we all gather together um, around kind of our, our circle area. Guided exploration is the focus lesson and forest choice. And in that other column, you'll see that we've written things that we need that day. It's like, okay, we need two adults and one saw. Um, you know, we need rope for roping off the whittling area. And now if you keep scrolling down and then we have sit spot journaling, our closing circle, and you're gonna see here, this, these teachers added this in. So this was for first and second grade, this is our workplace math. So this was our focus lesson for the day. And this was at the end of the school year. So children knew how to do all these things. And when they did those things then they got points and they could add up their points. And what we tried to do is see how many points we could get as an entire first, second grade class. So it wasn't necessarily kind of teams against each other. It was like, wow, how much have we learned this year and how many points can we get? Um, so just kind of a fun way to wrap up the year, almost do a post-assessment and do a little bit of math in there. And the children did not stop. I mean, they added things to this list. They're like, can we sing a song? Can we sing a fire song and get five points for that? So they were coming up with their own, um, their own kind of scoring system as well. All right. So let's come back over here. Um, so yeah, academics. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are wondering when we spend out time, spend time outdoors, are we just kind of skipping an academic work for that day or are we actually doing it outside or how does that work? 
Um, so the research shows, and our experiences back this up, that in fact students are doing serious academic work when they are outside, whether or not we are intentionally, you know, teaching a specific objective and giving them a pre and post assessment. The work is happening. The learning is happening. Um, there's lots and lots of research about this now and more coming out every single day. I put a few sources at the bottom of this slide if you, you know, are just looking for Someone, someone's doubting you about this, please show them some of these articles, but literally a Google search will turn up, you know, dozens of articles. But the gist of it is that time spent in nature improves academic performance. It also improves concentration and social skills. Um, so, you know, you want to get creative about using your outdoor classroom and how you can use it to meet required benchmarks or standards or goals that you have to teach in your classroom. Um, they don't have to happen indoors. And I would venture to say that pretty much any lesson you do indoors, you could also do outdoors. Um, might require some adaptation, but um, I believe that it's, it's all possible. So just a little prep ahead of time goes a long way. And I actually wrote a book about this. Um, so on the far right here, Teaching Outside, it's just 20 lesson plans, common core standards, how you can teach them outside, quick and easy. Um, some of them are things you can do right now without any preparation. Some require a little more prep, but um, I designed it for teachers who aren't super comfortable outside, but are interested in starting this work. So I encourage you to check that out. And I think if you click on the picture there, it should take you to a link to purchase the book. And if not, let me know and I can share that as well. And we just want to show a few examples of what a lesson plan for a specific day might look like um, using standards. So on the left, this is from my book. So this is a way to practice sight words outside, something that most lower elementary school teachers have to do. And here's how you can do it out in nature. Um, and then on the right is one of my Forest Friday lessons. And so you'll see just a different format, but kind of more details about each of those um, four routines and the cardinal directions that we were speaking about. So there's, again, no right or wrong way to plan your lessons, but just know that it is very, very possible to do academic work in the outdoor setting. And here um, is some work that some students have done. Um, and I've encountered this twice this week. So I think because it's spring in Vermont and everyone's excited about the snow melting and we've the birds are coming back and the skunks and the porcupines are out and students are planting seeds in their classroom. We've been talking about that all living things have needs, just like in the mouse house lesson. And so um, this, this is the inside work and having these conversations and scaffolding this experience outside. Um, what I have found most fascinating that when this lesson happens in the spring, the children know these answers right away because they've spent every week outside, you know, since the middle to late September. Um, so they know that living things need air, food, water, sunlight, and they need a home, they need shelter, they need a habitat. Um, and what comes up every single time is that living things need love. Um, and I just find that so profound and so heartening um, because it also ties into your social emotional learning curriculum um, that we are kind to one another, we care for one another, um, and that involves that can involve love, that can involve loving one another and respecting one another, and that living things need that. And with this constant contact and practicing these routines outside, children are developing empathy for living things. So the science behind use observations to describe patterns of what plants and animals, including humans, need to survive, that's a life science NGSS standard for kindergarten, um, goes much deeper for the children and their connection to the earth and to nature goes much deeper because they are spending time outside. And so love comes up. And so what these kindergartners did was they had this huge discussion about whether living things needed love or not. And they all thought that was true. And the teacher said, well, do you think everyone else in the school thinks that's true? They went and did a survey through the school asking these questions to other teachers and other students. And they came up with a chart like they did a graph and they did their tally marks. Do you think all living things need love? So it actually turned into a math lesson. It turned into kind of a social science lesson. They were interviewing, you know, um, I just think it's really, really rich and really empowering for the students. So I just wanted to share that. 
love comes up when you spend time in nature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So we are, of course, running a little behind here. So we're going to kind of... I know, we get a cruise. <laughs> next parts quickly. It's also important, but we will try. We're going to really try to leave time for questions at the end. So the next big topic that we wanted to talk about is safety. Um, this is a concern for a lot of people, obviously, and it is something that you definitely need to think about. So risky play. This is a very trendy topic right now. It's a buzzword you're hearing a lot. Um, what is it? Well, risky play is any kind of activity where kids are, you know, it could be disappear, get lost games where they're out of sight of adults for a little while. It could be rough and tumble play where they're, you know, pretend doing play fighting almost. It could be manipulating natural materials, so sticks, rocks, tools, that kind of thing, as you see in the pictures here. Um, so environments that support risky play, or excuse me, specifically risky outdoor play, really promote, you know, all aspects of children's development, their health, their behavior, all of these things are positively impacted by risky play, and this is supported by lots of research again. And the research actually shows that there's no correlation between risky play and increased injuries or aggressive behavior. And in fact, it actually shows the opposite. It shows improved social skills and social competence for children who engage in this kind of play. And I just read something that organized sports are actually far more risky in terms of the likelihood of injury than just playing outside. So there's some food for thought. Um, and Risky play also really promotes creativity and resilience, which are those soft skills that are so hard to teach sometimes. And so this kind of just takes care of that for you, which is great. And finally, you know, we think this is so important because this used to be a much more common practice for children, but in the past few generations, risky play has declined dramatically due to fear of litigation and lawsuits and all of these things and injuries. So definitely making a comeback and we highly encourage everyone to in let their kids engage in the risky play. You know, students, we know also, um, we're also asking them to take risk, risks in an academic setting. And those may be more challenging for some of your students, especially students with learning differences. But taking risks outdoors for them um, in a physical way, in a gross motor way, um, can give students an opportunity to be successful. Um, so they go hand in hand. Um, this slide, um, real quick, is um, a slide that um, I'm sharing with you from a consult that I did at a school in southern New England. Um, some preschool teachers take their students out every single week and they've got these phenomenal boulders um, in their forest and they were feeling really overwhelmed with four and five year olds um, climbing on these boulders and they weren't quite sure how to scaffold boulder play. So the first thing to think about is what is a risk and what is a hazard? A risk is something that a child can see and a child really, basically a child can see and a child can make a choice. Um, a hazard is something that a child can't see and can cause harm and that we are actually responsible for. So these boulders, depending on the season um, and depending on the children could be a risk or a hazard. So what I did with these teachers was I numbered these boulders. Boulder number one, um, after looking at it and making an assessment, we decided this is the best boulder for preschoolers to start on. Um, this is, there's clear ground around it. It's easy to climb up on the back. A teacher has access to it, can stand right there and coach and mentor students. Um, boulder number two is the next one and then so on number three. The little arrow there in that photograph is a birdhouse that's flipped upside down with a wasp's nest, a wasp's nest in it. That is an absolute hazard. So that was something that we needed to deal with. Um, so looking at the landscape and what are the affordances in your landscape and are they risk opp risk taking opportunities for your student? Are they appropriate, developmentally appropriate risk taking opportunities? Are they right for your class? And how do you scaffold that? This is a conversation to have. So the teachers had a conversation with their preschoolers and said, what's wonderful about climbing on rocks? What do we need to be careful of and how do we stay safe when we climb on the boulders? So that's a conversation that happens in the classroom. They write everything down, they review it, and they talk about it as they move through this. Um, so this is, this, is, this is work, but it also ensures um, some great risk-taking opportunities and some 
some places for teachers to feel confident and successful by scaffolding it and having the conversation with your students before heading out. Because otherwise, if you just let children climb all over all three of those, you don't have one teacher, one risk. You've got one teacher with many risks going on that is not manageable. So our next slide is about emergency protocols. So depending on your school, you may be required to prepare some sort of document outlining what you will do in the case of any number of emergencies. Um, so like with the schools Amy works with, that is a requirement. With my school, not so much, but it's still something that I think about and I have a plan for. Um, so just really quickly, what I do with my kids is, you know, our basic procedure for leaving the building is we take our first aid kit, we take our allergy and student, any sort of student medications, emergency forms for all the kids, cell phones that are charged, multiple ones, so some don't work when you're out in nature, and water. Those are sort of like the basic, basic things that you need. Um, in terms of ratios, we're required to have one adult for every six kids, and so that can be a lot of adults, um, depending on the size of your class. So this is where parent volunteers come in really handy. Um, you have people who are interested in joining you, invite them along. Um, when we're walking to and from our site, we always have an adult at the front, adult at the back, and everyone else is spaced through the middle. You know, street crossing, we do what we call blob time. Um, so everyone scoots in to make a big group and we all cross cross together. So your basic common sense things that you would do when you're on a field trip, those apply in the forest as well. Um, just maybe with a little more vigilance than usual. And there's a document here linked um, for the pr protocols for Amy's program eco and maybe we won't look at it right now. But Amy, do you just want to quickly give an overview. Yeah, sure. Um, so these emergency protocols are protocols that we came up with with the teachers um, that we work with here in Vermont because we actually experienced a lot of these things in the first couple of years that we went out. Um, so each school has emergency protocols for things that might happen in the school. So what we decided to do was create those emergency protocols for being outside. Um, if you, you know, one of them, one of them is what do we do if, you know, we count our magic number and one student and we don't have a student. What's the protocol for that? What's the protocol for if um, we come across someone who um, does not have a home and might be living in the forest and um, or a stranger or someone who comes up and talks to the kids or a dog that's loose. These were all things that we experienced and common sense is our best friend. We, we inherently will know what to do, but to have these things written down and as part of our program was really, um, was really, really helpful. One of them also probably more, one of the most important ones, ones was communication back to the school. So um, what is our protocol for communicating back to the school? Do cell phones work? We sign out at the office. They know where we're going. Um, at one school, we have radios and cell phones because the cell phones can't always be counted on. And also the school wanted us to be on their radio circuit um, so that if you know anything were happening in the school that we would um, have direct and immediate, um, immediate access to them. So that's been just really helpful to um, be able to create those emergency protocols with the school based on the school. Definitely check that out if you would like more info. With the clickable yeah, and I want to say about this too. It's like we we have created this, and you are more than welcome to take this. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel on emergency protocols. What you're going to see in that document is probably things that you may have already written and have for your school. So please feel free, um, you know, to 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 mimic it and create one for your school. Great. So in the interest of time, we're going to kind of zoom through a couple of things here and. When we send this out, you can take a closer look, but we're going to skip talking about fire and tools, which I know are super fun, but um, basically the gist of it is don't do those things without some training first and make sure you know what you're doing before you have kids doing those things. Um, and we're going to get to gear really quick. We'll spend a couple minutes on this. And then, you know, again, if people need to leave right at the end, uh, feel free, but we will stick around for a little bit longer and answer questions, even if we're over time. Okay, so good gear. Um, what do you need to go outside? You know, the clothing thing is huge. And 
again, I'm in California, so my needs are very different from those of Amy in Vermont, and everywhere in between is going to have different needs as well. In my classroom, kids are responsible for bringing what they need each day, so I have them keep a complete change of clothes at school, just in case they get muddy or dirty, which they almost always do. But other than that, you know, like tomorrow we're going to go out, it's supposed to rain, so I just reminded all my kids at the end of the day today, wear your boots, wear your raincoat, bring your change of clothes, and that's pretty much it. Um, but Amy's going to talk briefly about what to do when you have snow. <laughs> <laughs> so today we have not only have snow, but we have wet snow and we have rain coming in. So um, we had um, rain pants over snow pants today. That was really fun with 26 kindergartners. Um, but this it might be the this might be after you've gotten permission, you've made your fun lesson plans. Um, you know where you're going to go, you've done your site assessment. This is, this is one of the other big hurdles is access to clothing. Um, what, I, what I want people to realize is that we are a country of abundance and excess and there is clothing around. It's finding it um, and making it accessible in your classroom for your students. So you'll see in this photograph here, there are bins of hats, mittens, snow pants, um, wool socks because that's what we need in Vermont and that children sign those out um, and use them each week. We have parent volunteers that take things home and wash them um, but it's really the crux to a good program. This is not going out for recess. Recess is 15 or 20 minutes. We are inviting our students to have a nature immersion experience that is over an hour and a half, maybe up to a full day. So children need to be dressed appropriately. And we can also, we can expect parents to be able to provide all this clothing. So it really takes a community um, to get this clothing together and manage it and the lessons that children learn from dressing themselves, I know you all know this, are um, so empowering for children. I'm watching children today help each other zip their coats, pull their snow skirts over their boots, and that's a lot of fine motor work um, that, I, that I'm not sure children are getting so much of anymore. Fine motor work is more like pressing buttons now, and um, muscles and hands are atrophying. So zipping the coat and pulling the snow skirt down, pulling your mittens on, how do we problem solve around all of that? So um, something that feels like a hurdle, but something that is also a really great learning opportunity. And if you live in a place like Natalie, it might just be a little bit easier. <laughs> but it's still, you know, when we come back in after a rainy day, it's still a hurdle. <laughs> oh yeah, we've got a slide on that. We should yeah. zoom right along here. So, really quick, these are just so, yeah, I do. yeah, these slides, these slides are resources for you. So seasonal clothing. So that one is a list that we use for clothing that we need. Um, and then this, the other um, resource here from the Ithaca Forest Preschool that's located in New York State. That's how do we have fun and how do we dress for outside. These are both great resources for you to look at and consider um, how do we adapt this for where we live and what our climate is like? And it's also an opportunity to educate your community, school, parents, and caregivers, and your funders about this is really what we need to spend, you know, two hours plus outside every single week. Yeah. So, so those are there for you. This is, this is, and then this is what it looks like when you, when you come in. And so how are you going to manage this? Um, your all these clothes are wet and on the ground and children were cold and they were so thankful to get inside. It's okay for children to be cold and wet. wet. It builds resilience. It builds um, kind of, wow, I have, he there's heat in this building. I feel warm and I'm so grateful for being inside um, with my snack and having my school building. And look, we all did this together. Um, you're going to have muddy children potentially. So how are you going to deal with that? Lots of plastic bags. Have plastic bags, have children um, stripped down outside of the classroom, and hopefully your maintenance staff at your school um, like you <laughs> and are helpful. And also hopefully your parents are on board with um, the benefits of spending this time outside and the hygiene hypothesis and that mud and dirt are okay and it washes out of clothes. It sure does. So where do we get the gear? 
Yeah. Do you want to go? Do you want to talk about this, Natalie? Or? Um, no, I think you should. You had some. Good okay. Ones. So, so I, this is, I've kind of listed these bullet listed these in an order. So start with finding the gear inside your school. There is a lost and found box in school in most schools um, and especially after different seasons and especially at the end of the year that lost and found box in our schools gets spread out on a table and children can find what they want but a lot of times that stuff ends up in a trash bag and goes to the Salvation Army well I'm getting that trash bag and I'm going through it um, so start inside the school. What are your resources in the school? What are some of the teachers resources in your school? Do they have children's clothes that their children have outgrown. So start inside your school with your colleagues and your administration. Then go, you can start, you know, asking parents and caregivers as the school year starts if, if students have that. Um, we have found a lot of parents, um, not a lot, but if you, you know, a parent maybe in every classroom that is more than happy to help with this. And, um, and it may also know donors in the community that, um, you know, will buy 20 pairs of wool socks. This also, really goes really well with crafting your why that we talked about in the first webinar. Why is this work important? And when that story starts to get shared um, and ripples out throughout the community and children are sharing their nature notes and their nature stories with adults, um, the story spreads and then people understand the need for these things. Community secondhand stores, I would look there. I would go to garage sales in the summertime work with your local outdoor retailers. These are their customers of the future. So are their families. Um, so they can get you wholesale. They should be able to get you wholesale prices. Um, we have had some of the outdoor retailers here in Vermont donate um, generously to us. Donors Choose, I'm sure some of you know about Donors Choose for Teachers, a way for you to kind of put out to um, a larger population things that you need. And we have gotten rain pants and socks and boots um, paid for for us through Donors Choose. And document your story. So document your story, take photographs, um, get the statistics of what students need in your school. And I encourage you to go big. Um, you know, write a letter to L.L. Bean, write a letter to Patagonia, write a letter to REI. Um, these, once again, these are their future customers and we are, we are a country of abundance. And so there's clothing out there. Um, it takes a little extra work, but build your alliances and see who else can help you get it. And the nice thing is- Children that learn best. Yeah, children learn best when they're warm and comfortable outside and they're active, so. And if you're just starting out, you know, it's going to be a big push at the beginning, but then once you have this collection of gear, you're, you aren't having to start over every single year. You can add to it and, you know, add things as needed, but you won't have to get a whole new set of winter coats every year. So just keep that in mind too. All right. And finally, um, maybe we will just kind of explain what this is. This is about what you should be bringing when you go outside. Backpacks are the best tool for teachers. Mm -hmm. um, this is a link to a list of what should be in your backpack from Amy. Um, and I think that's pretty much all we need to say on that topic. Amy, anything else you wanted to add? really quickly? Um, I just want to, I after doing this work for 10 years, I've seen a lot of different bags <laughs> come and go um, with children, and I just really like backpacks, and so inside the backpack just for the student, this list is for teacher, what's in your backpack, and then the list is also for what's in the student's backpack, but the students only need snack or lunch, a water bottle, and a journal. So their backpacks aren't heavy, but what the backpacks allow the children to do is to have their hands free for walking or holding a partner's hand. And that photograph in the middle, those um, two students are sneaking up on an um, American Robin, and they're going so quietly. If they had like a lunchbox and one hand swinging or a messenger bag, um, their balance is off. And the backpacks are just so helpful for travel. They also make great pillows, like in the picture on the left-hand side. So these two students are listening to a story being told at the end of the day um, and are able to kind of lean back and be comfortable and look up into the, look up into the canopy of the forest. Um, also just great self-care. Um, how do we care for ourselves when we're out in the forest? We pack our backpack and we bring our gear. 
And with that, we are ready for questions. So I apologize, we're a little bit over time. Um, if people need to leave, we will continue recording um, for the next 10 minutes or so. And if there's any questions that we don't get to, we are talking about some different ideas for how we might address those. One idea is to possibly host a future webinar that's just for questions and answers where we will actually interact with you live and you can talk to us that way. So um, again, if your question doesn't get answered tonight, we will address it at some point in the future and we're gonna save all of this conversation as well so we can make sure we follow up with everyone. But if you do have a burning question for us right now, please um, type it into the chat box on the or in your screen, or if you need to open the chat box, I think at the top in the control panel, there's a little button that says more, and you click chat. Um, and just make sure that you select to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see the question, um, so we can make sure we get your questions. And if you have to go, thank you so much for joining us, and we will be sending out the slides and the uh, webinar soon. All right, so questions. Um, so Heidi asked if there are programs that are for younger children. She works with one to five-year-olds and has been moving towards this with her group. Um, yes, <laughs> the short answer is there definitely are programs for younger children. I would say those are actually more common. Um, I think preschool programs and early childhood programs are sort of the bread and butter of this work in the United States. And it's more and more moving into elementary schools. But at least when I was starting out, I mean, I could barely find anything that was for children older than four. So those programs do exist. Um, Amy, do you want to speak to that a little bit? Um, yeah, I, Heidi, if you want, you can email me. I can't remember. Um, I can't remember their names, but there is a couple in New Zealand that I met a few years ago. I don't, do you remember, Natalie, who they were? I remember, they're from, I don't remember their names, though. Yeah, they're from New Zealand, and they've done a lot of work with infants, yeah. infants up to two years old, outdoors in nature. So um, if you email me, I will, I will dig up their names, and I'll share that with you, because they've actually published um, a few, like, short books kind of you know, manuals on that. Um, they do some really wonderful work, so. Yeah, and our contact info is on the last slide that we will put up at the end. Um, there's a question here, Amy, will there be professional development in Montpelier again this summer? Yes, there will be. Um, the, July 8th through the, through the 11th, I believe, that's our first um, Eco Institute, Summer Institute course. And then um, the following week after that is our second one. So we do an eco level one for elementary teachers, kindergarten through sixth grade. And then we do another eco level one just for early childhood educators. So um, you can contact me or you can go to our website and we have not filled those courses yet, but we only do um, have 15 teachers join us for the summer. And we have a lot of fun together. We spend five days in the woods. <laughs> so we get an opportunity to go really deep um, and practice these core routines and then plenty of time um, for teachers um, to plan and kind of move, move this forward into their school year for that coming school year. Great. Um, any other questions for us? We have, unfortunately, I think a lot of people had to sign off, but that's okay. We are available, um, and that's a great opportunity for me to put up our contact info. So if you would like to continue this conversation, which we hope you will, please get in touch with us. Um, we're both active on social media, email. We have websites that you can check out. So please, please, please um, stay in touch with us. And we definitely encourage you, if you're not already, to continue the conversation on the NAAE Early Childhood in Early Childhood Environmental Education Group. That is a mouthful. Um, so the link there will take you to the homepage for that and you can join. It's free. It's just this wonderful community of like-minded people who are all really interested in and passionate about this work. So please join us there and, you know, let us know what else we can do to help you. I think that pretty much wraps it up. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us. And um, yeah, send questions our way. And if you have topics that you would love for us to cover um, at another time, um, please let us know that. And we'd, we'd, we'd be happy to do that. Yes, definitely. All right. Thanks, everyone. And we'll be sending all of these materials out to you shortly. Have a great night. And we will talk to you another time.